great privilege to stand here and to give you a few words through Professor Newstock about Professor Scott Samuelson. Professor Scott Samuelson is one of those promising souls whom the Hyatt Prize seeks to find, to identify, and to bring into the public eye, as has been its purpose since its propitious, future-oriented founding at the Dallas Institute 11 years ago. Now, the Hyatt Prize seeks a highly informed, thoroughly schooled master of his discipline, a professional who freely chooses to serve the common good, at best, among citizens who are not as, as advantaged, and a professional who does so steadfastly, consistently, day in and day out. A scholar who uses his intellect in service of bringing his esoteric knowledge and understanding out from within the tradition to the widest possible audience with the conviction that in our advanced democracy, the best there is to offer is the best not just for the strongest, the most privileged, but it is the best for all. Scott Samuelson has been described by his colleague, Scott Newstock, as being blessed with a singular gift for explaining complex, life-shifting thoughts in inordinately engaging terms, as thousands of students could surely attest. His voice is a clarion call for our fraught moment in time, a true voice to be heard by many who ought to listen. Newstock, describing this true voice, goes on to say that more than ever, the humanities need passionately articulate advocates, serious thinkers who can persuade all citizens of the enduring value of immersing ourselves in the stories that define us as human beings. He rightly says that such tactful persuasion demands clarity, integrity, and a finely attuned sense of audience. Newstock continues, Scott Samuelson embodies persuasive tact. His writing achieves that humanistic ideal of sprezzatura, artful artlessness. But beneath that charming conviviality of his prose lies a studied philosopher, a searching ethicist at his very heart. He continues, uh, it should be no surprise then that his Wall Street Journal and Atlantic op-eds went viral last year, or that his essay on the liberal arts and the fate of the American democracy was the most viewed online article in the history of Rhodes Magazine. He says, the guy can write. And he deploys his vast intellect in the service of the most important arguments for more equitable education, for civic engagement, for the very joys of human thought. In short, for the deepest human life, which in tribute to William James, who asserted that such life is everywhere, became the title and subject of Samuelson's first book as one appreciative reviewer of the deepest human life quipped. It seems like Samuelson has read everything, yet he wears his learning lightly in a companionable, inspiring fashion as a champion of philosophy for everyone, not merely the elite, and by putting his words into action by teaching hundreds of students a year at a community college, and also by teaching inmates in prisons, this scholar is a living embodiment of the ideal sought in Hyatt Prize recipients. Scott Samuelson, 
is in the dawn of his publishing and teaching career. And his is a voice that destines him to become a public intellectual. We at the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture agree with Scott Newstock. There might never be one more needed or perhaps better appreciated than today when the clear thinking that derives from deep knowledge and honest writing that rings true is in such short supply in our beloved republic. The Dallas Institute recognizes the important potential for our nation of this young voice. Thus, it is with great pleasure and as a high honor that I introduce to you, my friends, old and new, the winner from among a bevy of superb candidates, the winner of the 2015 Hyatt Prize in the Humanities, Scott Samuelson. Okay, ay, 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 thank you. That's a lot to live up to. That's a beautiful, beautiful introduction. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that. And, uh, and Scott, too, for uh, all those kind words. Um, I, you know, I, I really have to thank the Dallas Institute, uh, Larry, Nancy Marcus, Randy Gordon, and, and everyone else who's made this wonderful award possible, especially, of course, Kim Hyatt Jordan, whose extraordinary generosity stands behind this award. Um, I'm just so grateful for it for lots of reasons. One is, you know, I, it's such a marvelous idea for an award to give honor and help to someone when that honor and help is still really, really useful for them. And, <laughs> um, uh, and also, I'm just really grateful as a community college professor uh, l let me tell you that there are countless community college professors, some of whom are in the audience, some of my friends from the Community College Humanities Association, uh, who are just as deserving of recognition, if not more so. And, um, you know, they do so much for educating our democracy, and uh, um, I try to live up to their example. The title of my remarks today is A Refusal to Defend the Humanities. And um, I, it comes in four relatively short sections. And the first section I call The Fundamental Lesson of the Pastry Chef while you're eating your dessert. <laughs> I've been depressed reading all the recent defenses of the humanities, even though I'm guilty of a few of them myself. It's not because I think they're philosophically mistaken. In fact, I generally find myself nodding along in agreement, especially when I've written them. <laughs> the, the problem is that they fa fail as pieces of rhetoric. I have real trouble picturing those responsible for the erosion of the humanities being told how reading Proust enhances critical thinking in the global workplace and then exclaiming, what have I been doing? <laughs> I worry that our defensiveness is actually making the problem worse. When a couple breaks up, one of them usually advances heated arguments about why they should stay together. Has this strategy ever worked in the entire history of romance? <laughs> Doesn't defensiveness, even well-reasoned defensiveness, make the spurned party less attractive? Worse yet, so many of our defenses, the ones that champion the humanities as a path to economic success, reinforce the everything has a price mindset that's undermining our support in the first place. There's a perceptive couplet of Kipling's, the toad beneath the harrow knows exactly where each tooth point goes. When I read contemporary defenses of the humanities, I hear anguished croakings from under the tooth points of a giant harrow, unlikely to halt its progress for a few squished toads. If a defense of the humanities has a comment section, one of the first entries always says something to the effect of, Fine, but do you really expect me to go $60,000 in debt for a degree in anthropology? In other words, one huge problem is not that people doubt the value of the humanities, they just balk at the price of an education. If we believe in education and not just economic and technological training, we need to get out of the mindset that puts next to everything up for sale. We need to remember that education is primarily a gift 
handed down from one generation to the next, not a usurious commodity for which consumers must go into debt so that they can be credentialed for future economic achievement. Fundamentally, we need to ensure that a real education is affordable and widely possible. When it comes to public investment in education, there's not much sense in my paying taxes so your kid can make more money. That's your business, not mine. So it's no surprise that as the economic rationale for education gains ascendancy, legislature's desire to fund education goes down. We need to revive a sense of common purpose such that the investment in the education of our citizenry makes sense. My proposal is that we institute some form of mandatory public service, military or civil, such that young people serve their country and the country serves them in return by giving them an affordable shot at education, an updated version of the GI Bill. Not only would this diminish the why should I go into debt to study anthropology objection by making higher education economically accessible to all, it would also help to initiate students into adulthood and make them serious about more than immediate gratification and a future salary. In my experience, people of various political stripes support the idea of mandatory public service, so maybe a public-spirited policy will help us to overcome our crass economism. Or maybe a surprising and perhaps otherwise catastrophic shift in our material or political conditions will revive our sense of ourselves as the torchbearers of democracy and restore our commitment to liberal education. But I'm not holding my breath. What should we who care about the humanities do in the meantime? Well, first let's remember that there's still a fair amount of good faith between our educational systems and the public they serve. My God, I get paid by my fellow citizens to teach philosophy to working class students. That's a miracle by historical standards. <laughs> Large numbers of parents, students, and even administrators have the good sense to know that education is about more than training and credentialing. For them, as well as for those initially resistant to the humanities, my suggestion is that we adopt what I call the pastry chef strategy. One of the many things I love about pastry chefs is that they never defend pastry. <laughs> even, even though their work is routinely attacked as fattening and unhealthy, they never take to the New York Times to defend desserts. <laughs> Nutritional screeds against butter and sugar are answered only with a slice of blackberry apple upside down cake and a scoop of pistachio ice cream. Despite the silence of its chefs, the pastry business, amazingly enough, seems to be doing fine. A cook myself, I've learned a lot from pastry chefs, but perhaps no lesson as fundamental as the best defense is an irresistible offense. The next section of my paper is called The Payoff of Pricelessness. There's a charming story in Nobel physicist Richard Feynman's autobiography that I read as a parable about education. As a boy, he loved fixing radios, doing math problems, and reinventing already known scientific formulas. After having made a name for himself as a physicist, he got a plum post at Cornell University where he was paid to do his research. Suddenly he was intellectually paralyzed. Unable to concentrate on physics, he spent his days reading fairy tales and ogling coeds. He realized, physics disgusts me a little bit now, but I used to enjoy doing physics. Why did I enjoy it? I used to play with it. So I got this new attitude. Now that I'm burned out and I'll never accomplish anything, I'm going to play with physics whenever I want to without worrying about any importance whatsoever. One day when a student dropped a tray, Feynman found himself fascinated by how it wobbled on the cafeteria floor. He happily worked up a formula to describe its peculiar movement. When he showed it to his distinguished colleague, Hans Bethe said, Feynman, that's pretty interesting, but what's the importance of it? Why are you doing it? To which our hero replied, ha, there's no importance whatsoever. I'm just doing it for the fun of it. He'd rediscovered the dessert-like joy that permeates the best kind of work, no matter how demanding. Feynman ends the story by dryly observing, there was no importance to what I was doing, but ultimately there was. The diagrams and the whole business that I got the Nobel Prize for came from that piddling around with the wobbling plate. Obviously, it's a proper concern of ours to make a good living, just like it's a proper concern of our countries to have a humming economy. But I take the moral of the Feynman parable to be, 
If we want our citizens to get good jobs, dream up game-changing inventions, lead the world in Nobel Prizes, enjoy the fruits of a dynamic economy, and leave a mark in world history, we should engage as much as possible in learning for the sake of learning. In other words, we should have a strong commitment to liberal education. Really, learning stuff requires considerable discipline on the part of students, and the most humane way of inspiring and sustaining discipline involves rooting education in romance and wonder. Let's playfully piddle around with lots of pointless problems, because that playfulness and those problems will, more often than not, prove anything but pointless. Because the Hyatt Prize is given for work in the humanities, I began my talk by focusing on defenses of the humanities. But there's no firm boundary between the humanities and math and science, at least with regard to what I prize in education. How Richard Feynman engaged in physics is how we properly engage in the humanities. When I talk about the value of education, I'm inclined to speak of the liberal arts rather than just the humanities. I take the liberal arts to mean subjects considered independently of their economic value, subjects studied for their own intrinsic merits, subjects appropriate to free people. Though math and science are more easily enlisted to instrumental ends than the humanities, their value as crafts of freedom and beauty is just as imperiled. One of my own anguished croakings under the teeth of the harrow was published in the Wall Street Journal under the title, Would You Hire Socrates? I drew attention to a study showing that liberal arts majors tend to make decent money in the long run, though I qualified my pitch by saying, I have my doubts that selling philosophy as a path to future riches is going to be effective. I've yet to have a student read Aristotle's metaphysics and exclaim, this is really going to pay dividends at IBM. <laughs> in response, I got story after story from people who'd studied the liberal arts for the hell of it and then gone on to successful careers outside academia. One correspondent said he laughed out loud when he read my op-ed because studying Aristotle had indeed paid huge dividends for him at IBM. <laughs> His careful study of philosophy was exactly what allowed him to rise through the ranks from a low-level copier runner to a global project manager. But all the supportive letters came from people who already basked in the glow of the liberal arts. My op-ed, I'm afraid, had converted no bottom line obsessed Sauls to freedom-loving Pauls. All my correspondence told of how teachers had awoken their native desire to know by being passionately absorbed in things like Aristotle's metaphysics. They'd taken a gamble on studying subjects like philosophy in an environment where economic pressures, though certainly present, weren't crazily extreme. The skills that made my correspondence successful at places like IBM had been acquired as happy accidents of a romantic engagement with beautiful subjects. What I began to realize is that defenses of anything's value are mostly so much preaching to the choir. In fact, if preaching has any merit at all, it's mainly for the choir. Few are ever preached into conversion, though a choir member sometimes needs a reminder of why she's lending her mezzo-soprano to the church. <laughs> Generally speaking, you have to feel the value of something in your bones before you can know its value in your brain. One of the best things about teaching at a community college is that I routinely feel like I put in a good day's work. Sometimes a job at a prestigious academic institution can make you feel like you're simply anointing the privileged, or so I hear. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of absurdist comedy in my classrooms. Dark humor tempers the wit-maniacal sensibilities of the community college professors I know and love. However, as much as I have to deal with half-baked business models and woefully prepared students, many of whom are frazzled by difficult personal and economic conditions, I know that a few in my drooping audience are going to have their latent powers awoken and go on to advance themselves in society. After high school, Joe Hyde joined the military and served in a submarine. He was about 30 when he finally went back to school, full of anxiety and confusion about his future above sea level. I got to know him not because he cared a lick for philosophy, but because my logic class was conveniently scheduled. <laughs> week by week, I watched Joe light up as he learned and practiced the tools of debate and dialectic. When he transferred to the University of Iowa, Joe pursued a philosophy-based major, something he'd never imagined prior to taking my class, and soon graduated with a 4.0. He went on to law school at Berkeley, and now he's a public defender near his hometown in Ohio. Ain't that America? <laughs> Joe was never sold on philosophy because it would be a ticket to his dream job. What seduced him 
was that we debated a lot of super interesting, pointless things, like if the first cause argument proves God's existence, or if forcing someone to share his kidneys for nine months with an otherwise dying violinist is really analogous to compelling a raped woman to carry a fetus to term against her will. Plus, Joe had enough self-discipline to do the required work, even when the truth tables showed the contradictory premises always make the argument valid. The next section is called Political Loneliness and Deep Citizenship. If I'm not misremembering, people once spoke of the value of education, particularly public education, in terms of citizenship. Now the citizenship defense sounds as quaint and outdated as an afternoon of Glenn Miller's big band hits. Back in the old days, when I used to hear the citizenship defense, I'd think of things like memorizing the Gettysburg Address, learning how to parse an editorial, and acquiring enough historical and scientific knowledge not to be a complete dolt before the issues of the day. I'm not sure why that stuff seems outdated. It strikes me as still pretty damn significant. But I have to say that I've come to see citizenship in deeper terms yet. I learned the lesson in prison. Not long ago, I went to a talk by an ex-con who had benefited from my alma mater's liberal arts in prison program. After describing his study of neurobiology and philosophy, he mused, for the first time in my life, I felt like a real citizen. I was struck by the comment, but also puzzled. What does the study of neurobiology, fascinating as it is, have to do with making you into a citizen? I volunteer my time teaching at the Iowa Medical and Classification Center, AKA Oakdale Prison. So after a good session there on Taoism, I casually asked the inmates if they understood what the ex-con meant. A lifer raised his hand and volunteered, I know exactly what he was getting at. All my life, I felt like it's me against the world, like I've had to fight for everything I get. But in this class, it's different. I feel like what I say matters. Even when people disagree with me, it's not a life-threatening thing. What's in my brain has some dignity, and I feel like what I'm learning is giving it more dignity. I feel like a real citizen in here, just like what the ex-con felt like in his classes. The prisoners around our makeshift seminar table nodded in agreement. One added, yeah, I like this citizenship thing. Aristotle says that a person without politics is like a game piece without the game. Along similar lines, the great educator Earl Shoris, in his book Riches for the Poor, diagnoses the problem of political loneliness, which he says has two sources, hatred of others who are not good enough to be friends or allies, and hatred of oneself who is not good enough to have friends and allies. Political loneliness is obviously a source of crime as well as a part of the debilitating despair associated with poverty. But up to a point, doesn't a kind of gnawing atomism afflict many economically secure members of our society too? The beauty of the liberal arts is not simply that they help us to cast informed votes. They help us to overcome political loneliness. They put us back in the game by expanding our concept of friends and allies to include those who have different beliefs and immediate interests from our own. Through the study of subjects like philosophy, we learn to find our own voice. Through the study of subjects like literature, we learn to hear other voices. Through the study of subjects like history, we learn what it means for those voices to clash and harmonize. Through the study of any subject in the liberal arts, we learn how to uncover our genuine commitments, trade arguments and insights, and dwell in the tensions of plurality. These are priceless lessons. If we want a country where citizens listen to other voices in our vast conversation and then add their distinctive voices to it, don't we have a profound interest in getting people out of the me against the world mindset? I think my pastry chef point applies here too. Had I put up signs around the prison saying, come to philosophy class and learn how to feel like citizens, I wouldn't have gotten as many takers as simply saying, want to learn the secrets of weird, ancient, mystical Chinese philosophy. Just like the economic defense, the citizenship defense of the liberal arts is effective, mainly once we've entered into the invisible republic of philosophy. But when that invisible republic is made manifest, and I rarely feel it as poignantly as I do in my prison classes, we know there's a home for our humanity that's not worth selling for the world. My last section is called the joy at the top of the soul. A common defense of the liberal arts is that they make us more human. It's often said in rebuttal that this is total crap. First, what does it mean to be more human? Isn't that a vacuous concept? 
Second, even if there is a set of virtues implied by the word human, isn't it the case that those devoted to the study of humanities have plenty of vices, and those uneducated in literature and history are just as likely to have humane virtues? These criticisms need to be addressed, but I stand by the humanizing defense of the liberal arts. In my view, if we don't believe in the fundamental value of the examined life, if we don't think the humanities make us more human, I don't think we have a leg to stand on. When it comes to human nature, I'm inclined to believe that our never total message is always in the process of being spelled out. I feel like I was sent to this earth to be an explorer of being, not the permanent resident of a well-defined nature. So my impulse is to explore what's going on in my mind, what's going on in other minds, how things are, how things could be, and how things should be. I have all sorts of vices, and were I under the illusion that my colleagues were paragons of moral excellence, you should add ignoramus to the long list of my indictments. <laughs> but if we're worth anything at all as teachers and scholars, we do have this one very peculiar virtue, the virtue of the pursuit of the just, the beautiful, and the true the virtue of the mental explorer. This is certainly not the only virtue worth having, and it's often embodied by otherwise very flawed people. But it's a precious virtue, one that has the power to humanize our other virtues and even some of our vices. I don't think there's a perfect theory of human nature, but one of the most usable and suggestive is found in the Republic, where Plato, through the mouthpiece of Socrates, describes a three-tiered motivational structure in our psychology. The most basic part, Plato calls it the appetitive part of the soul, wants to get pleasure and to avoid pain. This is the consumerist part of us that likes eating and having sex, getting money and buying stuff. The next part, Plato calls it the spirited part of the soul, craves honor and fears shame. At its best, this is the citizen part of us that wants to make a contribution and to be respected for it. At its worst, it's the childish look-at-me attitude that longs for attention and fame. Plato calls the highest part of us the rational part of the soul. Rationality can be degraded to mean simply calculation and assessment, but in its glory, it's the wondering part of us that likes to know how things really are and strives not only to get things right, but to be in the right. Plato's theory of the three-part soul accounts neatly for the various defenses of the humanities. Most basically, there's the consumerism defense. Study the humanities so you can contribute to the economy and make some dough. A notch higher is the citizenship defense. Study the humanities so you can increase your powers and participate effectively in the leadership of our society. Highest of all is the intrinsic good defense. Study the humanities because the organ in your skull is the most complex thing known to exist in the universe, so why not take it for a test drive? Though all these defenses are true, I found that stimulating the joy at the top of the soul is the best goal for me as a teacher. In Democratic Vistas, Walt Whitman says, there is, in sanest hours, a consciousness, a thought that rises, independent, lifted out from all else, calm, like the stars, shining eternal. This is the thought of identity, yours for you, whoever you are, as mine for me. Miracle of miracles, beyond statement, most spiritual and vaguest of Earth's dreams, yet hardest basic fact, and only entrance to all facts. This miraculous identity belongs to each and every one of us, including the dullest student falling asleep in the back row. To have that identity awoken, to explore its mysteries and freedoms, to open its hidden doors to the facts and possibilities of the world, these are vital activities, full of difficulty and struggle, like all joys, for instance, children, but ultimately gratifying, shining eternal, like the stars. Since ancient Greece and Rome had class-based societies built on the labor of slaves and women, free men could afford to be cavalier about putting food on the table and could, if they wanted, devote themselves to their miraculous identities, in other words, to the goods of self-government, happiness, and contemplation. As much as I look to classical civilization for guidance, I think it's cramping and mean-spirited, particularly when technology expands the possibilities of leisure, to reserve the goods of citizenship and humanity for the elites while limiting the training of everyone else to a replaceable economic purpose. That a society like ours should expect college to prepare students for economic life is neither shocking nor lamentable. 
A just society means that all of us are going to have to contribute to the economy. The community college, one of the many ingenious products of the American imagination, is a wonderful example of what a democratic educational institution can look like. We should want people to have decent paying jobs and the possibility of upward mobility, but we should always keep an eye on the higher prizes of being human. I issue this reminder not just to bottom line obsessed administrators, Philistine politicians, job obsessed parents, stingy taxpayers, and blase students, but to teachers and professors who get caught up in their own somewhat farcical versions of careerism, or worse yet, forget that they should be serving almond cake with strawberry rhubarb compote, and instead offer students apple core mush in the name of a harebrained nutritional theory. <laughs> According to Karl Marx's finest vision of justice, nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. We should be able to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, and philosophize after dinner. <laughs> I myself have grave doubts about communism's power to realize this dream. In my view, a commercial economy attached to and regulated by a strong Republican form of government gives us a much better shot at unleashing the varied potentialities in the populace at large. Our society has horrendous problems and Marx himself predicted the biggest one that now afflicts us. We're allowing the commercial economy to eat away at all the non-commercial goods that make life worth living. Still, I see his dream of people actualizing the various parts of their souls being realized in flashes on a regular basis right here in America. Except for his always interesting papers, my former student Ryan Danielson didn't stand out much in class. I was surprised to get a letter from him a couple of years after he left Kirkwood. He told me about how he'd been fascinated by a line from the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer that I had offhandedly quoted in class. Rather than ask me where the line came from, he thought he'd find the quotation for himself. He'd come home from his factory job and crack open some philosophy. When he didn't find the line in volumes one or two of The World as Will and Representation, he started in on Pererga and Paralampomena and after the past couple years of searching, finally found the single sentence that had led him through thousands of pages of German pessimism. <laughs> <clears throat> he was writing to tell me how grateful he was for his odyssey. I recently had drinks with Ryan, now a concrete finisher by profession and a new father. He's finishing up a novel as well as translating Tang Dynasty poems about drunkenness. I find someone like Ryan to be an exemplary kind of American character. His time as my student had no direct benefit on his work as a concrete finisher. As an aside, I think the craft and trade apprenticeship is a kind of education that also needs defending in our frenzied race to credential people. I don't see why we can't aim to graduate high school students, let alone college students, who know something and can do something. But Ryan's time in a philosophy class dignified and brightened a part of him that, like many of my inmate students, had been otherwise given over to rage and loneliness as we engage in our great experiment of extending higher education to the populace. Please, 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 let's remember that we're more than an economy. As members of a democratic republic, we should be trying to do more, not less, to cultivate the surprising minds and characters of our fellow citizens. My comparison of the liberal arts to pastries is intended to highlight, especially in a ravenous consumerist society like ours, that we're made to love them and that we should emphasize and celebrate their delectability, perhaps even over their nutritional value. We should encourage and reward public scholarship. We should remember that, as important as specialisms are, the disciplines of the liberal arts have a deliciousness that, in principle, anyone can savor. May the spirit of the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture become a guidepost for the direction of academia. When the humanities return to their roots in the fundamental exploration of human experience, the Socratic practice of philosophy, they naturally call forth all the wonderful things said in their defense. Admittedly, the liberal arts are going to need more than just fine chefs of the arts and sciences to undo the trends that now threaten them. A certain set of changes on the ground is going to be necessary to reorient public consciousness about their value. But without ardor and joy, what's the point? As fond as I am of good food, I have to admit that my pastry analogy breaks down. We're more than just consumers. 
the liberal arts aren't just delicious and even nutritious courses of our education. They speak to something intrinsically precious about us, the miracle of all miracles that fills us with wonder about who we are and why the stars wheel overhead and how our inmost wonder and those far off stars are connected. We've traditionally used religiously charged language to describe this part of us that isn't up for sale and has its own unique cravings and values, though philosophers have sometimes employed non-religious terms to defend this sacred something. However you slice it, we should believe in the humanities because we believe in our humanity. There's a passage in the Analects in which the disciple Tsagong asks nervously what Confucius thinks of him. The master tells him that he's a vessel. For a hovering moment, the disciple is good only for some instrumental purpose. He's merely a tool for others' needs. He's just a part of the economy. Confucius says of Tsukong essentially what Thomas Hobbes says of all humanity. The value or worth of a man is, as of all other things, his price. That is to say, so much as would be given for the use of his power, and therefore not absolute, but a thing dependent on the need and judgment of another. It is uniquely belittling, a real slap in the face, even to Tsukong, a successful businessman, who, for all we know, might have traded in commercial bulls and vases. Then Confucius smiles and adds, you are a most precious and sacred kind of vessel. And suddenly day breaks. The student's humanity, which was a utilitarian commodity, is now revealed as a work of art, a piece of jade to be carved and decorated and admired, a priceless vase for the sacred give and take of the universe. Let me end with an observation by Marilyn Robinson, my fellow denizen of Iowa City. In her collection of essays, when I was a child, I read books. She says, I have seen trinkets made from the fragments of Ming vases that were systematically smashed by Mao's Red Guard. If we let our universities die back to corporate laboratories and trade schools, we'll have done something quieter and vastly more destructive. Thank you. Scott so much for, for that presentation and we wanted to have a little conversation how many chances do we get to have a conversation among an audience like this about philosophy right so we're going to talk about philosophy for a few minutes we realize we're running behind we're going to be respectful of your time and so uh, but but I wanted to begin by asking uh, Dr. Andy Gordon who is has a multifaceted life you know, in the humanities, in, as a lawyer uh, for a major firm here in Dallas and worldwide. And uh, he and I talk often about the humanities. And I wanted to start by asking him, R R Randy, does, uh, does philosophy enter your life, your professional life? In respect of time, no. <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> legal theory really is philosophy. A lot of what we spend our time doing as lawyers is trying to figure out the best way of ordering society, the best way of achieving justice. And so those definitions are, you know, the big questions. It's just an application of those big questions within our particular domain. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Marcus, this is, uh, Dr. Samuelson is the first uh, recipient we've ever uh, given the award to in philosophy. And I know that you have a penchant and, a, and a, an attraction to philosophy, even though your discipline itself is literature. What most attracted you about Dr. Samuelson's work? Larry, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> When I came to the Dallas Institute, I heard some high-minded thinking, and I had one master's degree at that point.
point, and I, I really was a seeker, as every one of us in this room are seekers. And then I did a lot of work, and, and then life went forward, and along came Scott Samuelson. And in his writing, I saw an implicit understanding of a concept that at first gave me great difficulty. Uh, at the Dallas Institute, there kept being this discussion about form. And I really didn't understand what that was. But finally, it was, I think, Aristotle's understanding of substantial form. That form that gives anything its own particular essence. And of course, the essence of us men and women is our in own intellectual souls. And I felt that that premise was the underpinning of Dr. Samuelson's work, and we needed to hear from him. And so this, and also his work, which implies the radical democracy of the classroom, and of course, heaven has to be a very democratic place, made me want to know this man, and for us in Dallas and all the world, and especially in our nation, to know this man. So thank you, Larry, for letting me say that. <laughs> okay. yeah. So uh, I'm interested, though. You know, uh, uh, Scott, I, I really love your book. I, I, I love it as much for the anecdotes as, as for anything, the stories you tell about your students. Your mostly rough-hewn students who come back to you with with really jewels and pearls of, of leading this life that you call the philosophic life. The subtitle of your book is, the title is The Deepest Human Life, and then your subtitle is An Introduction to Philosophy for Everyone. Is philosophy for everyone different from philosophy? Yeah, um, on, on that score, I guess I'm gonna say no. I mean, I think of it as from that kind of Socratic angle. And, and for me, the beauty of Socrates was that he was always out and about with, with everyone. Um, and, and so I, I do think of philosophy as having a value for everyone. It's certainly true that it, it's wonderful to have high-level philosophy going on, some of which will be a little esoteric and perhaps not accessible to everyone. But it's always easy for that stuff to get out of touch itself. And it, it, it benefits by having to become answerable at some level, I think, to human nature. I, you know, the subtitle of my book, An Introduction to Philosophy for Everyone, it's meant to be a little bit naughty, though I'm sure no one really ever gets it but me in this way, because <laughs> the, you know, everyone thinks, oh, an introduction to philosophy for everyone means an introduction to philosophy for non-specialists, for people outside of academia in particular, which of course it does mean that. But the other thing I always take it to mean is, uh, I sometimes wonder if philosophers couldn't use a reintroduction to their subjects. So by, <laughs> by everyone, uh, I mean you philosophers out there too. Yeah, good. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Randy, do you, you know, I, I hear you talk about your colleagues saying, what are you writing that for? What, what is this? <laughs> well, not those colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> no, some of your colleagues, though. And, and so, but, but there's an insistence in you that you're going to be philosophic, as I understand Scott to be talking about it, right? Well, and it, it, w one of the things that often gets overlooked is, you know, when we think about philosophy, we tend to think about it after the rise of analytic philosophy in the 20th century heavily logic-driven, a lot of uh, scientific overlay and so forth. What we forget is a lot of first-rate philosophy was actually lit written as literature, uh, written as drama, written in dialogic form and so forth. Um, and, and so it's part of that great narrative tradition that we have um, in the West. And that was accessible to everyone. That is accessible to everyone. Um, and so I think that esoteric sort of philosophy that that we've come to think of from philosophy 101, or the, at least the second half of the semester, um, <laughs> really, really gets beyond the core principles and what we can all engage with. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're gonna take some questions from you in just a couple of minutes, so be thinking about it. But, uh, so, so we've all studied some philosophy. The meaning of the word itself, remind us of that. What, what is the actual etymology of the word, Scott? Yeah, it's a compound word that you know, combines philia and sophia, 
love and wisdom. I always ask my students when I'm trying to get them to piece out the etymology for themselves. I always say, you know, when, when do we use words like, you know, that, that first part of the expression? I usually say, pedophilia? <laughs> 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 but, um, uh, but in any case, yeah, the, it, it means the love of wisdom. And to me, the really beautiful thing about that etymology is, and, and I sort of allude to this in, in my remarks, that we often approach education in terms of just simply kind of indoctrinating people into wisdom, or at least what we claim to be wisdom, whereas philosophy is not necessarily about giving people wisdom, though one hopes that at some level that might be the ultimate end, but it's about the pursuit of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It is a kind of search, and in that sense, it's, it's meant to be empowering for people. Um, uh, and, and it's also the kind of thing that, that creates a whole suit, new set of possibilities. In that sense, it's, it's almost like the mind and its active state of just exploring and searching mm -hmm. things out. I liked how you put it, that we're all seekers at some level, and I see that's the emphasis that I want to put in philosophy is on the love of wisdom, not, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. the having of it. Not the nailing of it. Right, <laughs> right. You're, yeah, and, and, and uh, Nancy, you had, um, you wrote your dissertation, a brilliant dissertation on Shakespeare, but you had a mentor who was a philosopher, and he put into you uh, some deep love of the philosophic life, didn't he? Well, he really did. This was a man who was very active at the Dallas Institute, a brilliant man. His name was Dr. Stephen Wentworth Arndt, and uh, he, was a, he was a philosopher, but he also taught himself, he, at the time I had the privilege of studying with him, 11 languages, never having had a class in language with only the aid of a phonetic, or of various phonetic dictionaries. Brilliant, brilliant man who woke me up in life. <laughs> and um, a personal note, if you'll, Indulge me, Larry. Um, when I asked him if he would act as my Oxford-style one-on-one -on -one tutor, he said to me, let me think about it. So he spoke to his wife. They thought about it. He had taught me philosophy and the ethical life and also Latin. And he called me back and he said, this is so politically incorrect, so I can't <laughs> believe I'm going to say this. He said, I'd like to teach one woman to think. <laughs> so at the end of five years, I said, well, Dr. Arndt, do you think I can think? He said, I think so. I'm wagering. <laughs> <laughs> but he did teach me to love philosophy. Larry. He was a taskmaster, but he was, he was a, a taskmaster of the right sort. So what you all are saying is that, um, you know, there, there are philosophers among us. I mean, in this group, there are many philosophers. So when I say that Kim Jordan uh, is devoted to lifelong learning, then that's the thing you're talking about, right? To get on a path that really never ends. So it's the search rather than the actual appropriation of it. So, Yeah, that's right. And I, and I know as a teacher, that's one of the things I always try to mentally keep at the forefront uh, uh, is this idea that my, the students sitting out in my audience are potential philosophers, and some of them very much on that journey already, and I want them to see themselves like that. And, and the book is written in that way, too. They're trying to, that one of my first chapters is about trying to see yourself as Odysseus, as being on a kind of journey in life. And, uh, you know, we, like I said, we have the most complex thing in the universe in our skull, and we're meant to use it. Uh, so, so tell us where, uh, uh, any of you, I guess I'm directing this at, at Scott mostly, tell us where to start you know, with, uh, let's say, the classics of philosophy. Where in Plato? Where in, what, what would you give us as a first? Well, I, I kind of would like to hear what, say, Randy and Nancy have to say. What, what, where, 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 would, where should we start? I have my answers, but... Start with Derry Don, then kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that is a D-E-R-R-I-D-A. <laughs> and Randy's tongue is firmly in his cheek. <laughs> Always. Well, I would say to this audience, I don't know how many of us have had a chance yet to read The Deepest Human Life, but The Deepest Human Life is addressed, I think, implicitly to our electorate, of which we each are a part. And 
Scott Samuelson has a wide breadth of knowledge and also great depth of knowledge, an appreciation and understanding of the disciplines that gave us the civilization, the amenities, the rights, the freedoms we enjoy. And I would say that it is that kind of, um, I mean, I love introductions. My whole life I will love introductions. He intends this book as an introduction. It is an introduction to the possibility of a contemplative life, which I would hold is the greatest happiness that human life affords. So thank you, Scott. Well, thanks, yeah. Doing and, that. I mean, then that is the point, is to kind of just get people into these great books that you're asking about. Um, uh, and and I, I guess I would stand up for Plato myself and that the, the particularly, you know, the book that's widely available as The Last Days of Socrates seems to me just a wonderful book that, that it has four dialogues in it that portray the last days of Socrates and you get to see uh, not just, you know, philosophy talking the talk but walking the walk and, uh, you know, so to me that's kind of second to none that Socrates so embodies philosophy in that way. Um, and, and, and what's amazing about Plato's work is that it, it speaks so directly still to people um, across all these millennia. You know, you still read him and there's something incredibly fresh and alive about it that, that is still ex largely accessible to almost anyone who can read. So, uh, you know, you can't go wrong. In, in all seriousness, in my area, uh, legal philosophy, I'd start with Antigone. Uh, wow. which examines this difference between systems of rules that are incompatible, which is lawful. A great play by Sophocles, right? So questions from, from you all? Questions, comments, anything from anyone? Be philosophic. Yes, in the back. Is that Sharon? Yes. Yes, okay. Do you use, do you know or do you use... Um, the Garter book, Sophie's World, to teach young students uh, about philosophy in the narrative of this 14-year-old girl. I have not used it in, in, as a teacher, but I, I'm very fond of the book. It's a lovely little book that a lot of people might know, Sophie's World, that uh, gives a kind of history of philosophy in, in, a, in a really accessible way. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just an absolutely lovely book. And I always wonder about, you know, when to introduce philosophy to people. I, I certainly think by the time you're around 14, you're in a good position to, to really start to access what philosophy can be all about. So, yeah, I'd love to see that book uh, more widely known. I, my daughter's about that age, and I think I'll, I'll give it to her, so. Dr. Samuelson, I think it's fascinating that you teach students both inside prison and outside prison. And I'm curious as if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, how you do that and what the difference in the students if there is a difference, what's the attitude and the characteristics? Yeah, I mean, I, I have, on the whole, better students in prison. Um, uh, <laughs> they, for one, they are truly a captive audience. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, but they are, uh, you know, I mean, they're really hungry for wanting to learn something, which to me is what you want in a student, regardless of their kind of skills, that hunger to learn will, will go a long way. And I certainly have those students outside of prison as well, but the quotient is, is a little different. But uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've just had really marvelous experiences in prison. And as I, you know, mentioned in here, you know, that idea of citizenship and feeling that sense of citizenship is, I think, incredibly powerful, and I would really like to see us invest a lot more in that kind of education mm -hmm. in prisons. I mean, obviously, it's great to have some vocational, educational programs in prison to help people be able to get a job when they get out, but, but also to have something like the liberal arts for them to, uh, uh, you know, feel like human beings, uh, I, I think that's a real priceless thing and, and worth it on any number of levels. Another question? Come on. Yes, over here. I just wanted to go, want you to go a little further on the prison thing. What are they required to get in the situation? Do they get credit for being there or not being there? Well, here's the thing is that r right now I just do volunteer teaching at prison, so th they, they are getting no credit for it. It is simply for their own uh, uh, edification. Um, I would like to see 
developed a kind of program at the prison where I teach that, that would allow them to get credit for it. Uh, there, and there are some models of that. As I mentioned, my alma mater, Grinnell College, has a liberal arts in prison program that has been a wonderful experience for the professors and the students. Um, so yeah, those programs do exist, but as yet, I'm not officially part of that. Maybe one more question from someone? I have a question. Okay, yes, Dr. Marcus. Um, Dr. Samuelson, would you please tell us about your plans for the future? Well, um, <laughs> I'm gonna have a glass of wine tonight, I think. <laughs> But um, the, in, in terms of my work, right now I'm trying to finish a book uh, that is called Seven Ways of Looking at Pointless Suffering. And, the, I, and, and, and like my first book where I weave the stories of uh, ordinary people with the stories of, of the great philosophers and great philosophical ideas in Seven Ways of Looking at Pointless Suffering, I try to do something similar with really what's one of the most difficult philosophical questions of all, which is how to confront death and extreme suffering and pain, um, which is something I often have students coming to my classroom wondering about, uh, dealing with. Uh, and also, I, I weave some of the stories from my work in prison with it. Uh, the, the, a lot of the prisoners uh, uh, have a real stake in these questions of suffering, both as people who have sometimes inflicted it as well as who have suffered it themselves and, and, and maybe are suffering it currently. So, um, you know, it's, it's certainly in the spirit of, of my first book, only in this case, uh, with more of a focus on, on suffering. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Now, th this is, uh, I love what you said at the end of your talk about joy. You know, the tagline of the Dallas Institute is learning the greatest pleasure. And I think the pleasure of learning has to do with that joy that you're talking about, you know, the reflective life, the philosophic life. So you really brought us something special of yourself today, and we thank you for that. Dr. Gordon, thank you. Dr. Marcus, thank you for being with us. And we're going to go to the podium now for the most important part of our luncheon. And I'll go over here and announce the 11th annual, this starts our second decade, the 11th annual Hyatt Prize in the Humanity goes in 2015 to Professor Scott Samuelson. So, Dr. Gordon, would you present the trophy? Sorry, it's not bold. <laughs> Thank you so much, it's really an honor. <laughs> and the thing that will allow that sabbatical Dr. Marcus, would you present the check? Scott Samuelson, to your good and the good of all our world, God bless you. Thank you all for being here today. We're adjourned. Appreciate your being with us. Thank you. <laughs>